we are talking supersized faith. A fun, fun play on the old supersize me. I didn't even realize I had lost out on the joy of supersize me until I started studying for this message. I mean, I don't do McDonald's too often, but I thought it was still something, but I guess it's been gone for about 17 years now. Can you believe 17 years since we've had the joy of being able to say, supersize me? Extra 25 cents and an extra 10 ounces of Coke. Extra 25 cents, a whole other ounce of French fries. Man, the joy and the satisfaction, the caloric intake, all for 25 cents more. And you know, God, he wants us to live in a supersized faith. Not this small faith, not a regular faith, not even a large faith, but a super sized faith. And that supersized faith, it, it costs you. It is an investment, but it is a worthwhile investment. Because when you're willing to supersize your faith, you will walk in a mindset to know that what God is able to accomplish in his hands is so much greater than what you can control. When you walk in a supersized faith, you're going to be willing to take some chances that you would have called yourself crazy to take before. When you walk in a supersized faith, you're not going to walk around with all the answers of how. But Chris, you're definitely going to walk around with the answer that I know God will. And there's going to be a confidence. There's going to be a certainty. And so to walk in a supersized faith, we are looking at what does this look like? We began last week and we looked at knowing your faith. Your faith is something you can get to know. Your faith is something you can build a relationship with. And we looked how knowing your faith, what that looks like, that you're meant to live in faith, that you're marked through faith, and that you're motivated by faith. This morning, we move forward from knowing your faith, and we're going to look at stowing your faith. We're going to look at a a section of scripture in Hebrews chapter 10. We're going to start in verse 35 this morning. The author of Hebrews, he says, So do not throw away your confidence. You remember the definition of faith from last week, Hebrews 11.1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. The NIV translation words it as faith is the confidence of things hoped for. Do not throw away your confidence, he says a few verses before. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. For in just a little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. And, but my righteous one will live by faith. And I take no pleasure in the one who shrinks back. But we do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed, but to those who have faith and are saved. Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. Your word, it is challenging, but it is worth it. Lord, we pray that you will show us the worth of your word this morning that it will be something that is planted deep within, that we would be able to recall it easily this week, that we would be able to live through it this week, and that, Lord, you would take us to new levels in you by it this week. We give you the glory, the praise, and the honor. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, God, who does not want to live or be known as a person with great faith? We all want to be remembered as people as great faith. We all want to be remembered and and known as somebody that trusts God implicitly. Hebrews chapter 11, it's 40-something verses of going through people of immense faith that trusted God throughout uh, odds and um, circumstances that would make any person crumble. But these people stood firm to the end. And they're revered and they're admired. 
And more importantly than the reputation that comes from faith is the fact that God moves in great faith. He moves in so many different ways when our faith is great. He moves in the realm of protection. I remember the Bible story, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You remember the three boys, three young men that refused to bow down to King Nebuchadnezzar's statue. Even at the risk of capital punishment, they still refused to bow down. And when capital punishment was issued and decreed, they're thrown into the furnace and their great faith pays off. Great faith like men like Daniel, who lived in the same time frame as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. When another decree went out that there is only one person to pray to and it wasn't the Lord God Almighty. And Daniel, when any of us would have taken precaution and prayed with, 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 um, with wisdom and maybe not in front of the open window in front of the whole city, not so with Daniel. He prays right there in 12 noon, the middle of daylight, the curtains drawn or pulled back for everybody to see. He's thrown into the lion's den and great faith pays off. You don't even have to be a Christian for great faith to pay off. Rahab, the woman of questionable occupation from Joshua. She hides the Israelite spies. She keeps them safe. She sends her own people in one direction while she sends Israelite spies back home in the other direction. The only thing she asked is that her family would be spared and great faith pays off. There's protection through great faith. There's also provision in great faith. I remember the woman with the issue of blood that described in the Gospels who says, if I could just touch that little piece of his garment, I would see healing. And healing is provided in that moment. Great faith shows purpose. David, he sees purpose revealed as he stands before Goliath on the battlefield. And he proclaims to Goliath, you come at me with a sword and a spear and a javelin, but I come at you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies. And great faith births great purpose. When you think of great faith, you either think about those who believe for huge blessing, like those three Ps, purpose, protection, provision, or you think of those that are able to stand firm in the middle of incredible burden. Next week, we'll look a little bit more at the huge blessing part and believing God for something bigger than we are, bigger than we can do. Today, let's look at what maintains faith under great adversity. We need to be able to stow our faith when faith is being asked to survive in less than ideal environments. To know that for faith to survive, we need to know it must be stowed away. And because I'm right there with you, I realize that none of you used the word stowed this week. Not a single one of us used it. In fact, the only reason why I'm using it today is because it rhymes with no, your faith from last week. And it rhymes with the next two messages in our series over the next few weeks. You can think and contemplate on that, see if you can guess the titles over the next few weeks. So maybe we need to have a definition and to re educate ourselves on what stow is. Mainly used in nautical usages, it means to literally put the cargo or provisions in the place intended for them. Or it means to put the actual pieces of the ship, maybe the gear, maybe the sails, maybe the different components, when they're not in use, to be able to put them in a stored position. Now, faith is always something that needs to be used. So to say, when I'm not using my faith, I'm going to stow it away, that does not feel quite correct. However, that first definition, to put in places that God intends. God gives faith. So where am I putting that faith that he gives? Am I putting it where he intends it to go? There's another definition that also describes the word stow. It says to have or to afford room for. 
In the same way how God gives faith, the faith that he gives, not only am I using it how he intends it, but do I have room for it in my life? I want to make sure I have room in my life for the faith that God is going to give. And so much times my life gets crowded. It gets crowded with busyness. It gets crowded with other people's voices. It gets crowded with so many things that block the faith that God wants me to live in. But if I were to make room for it so that it could be stowed in my life correctly, how strongly could it survive? I want to make sure there's room in my life for the faith he gives. How do I do this? Because there's one thing for certain, drudgery, it's going to appear, and we're going to be brought down. Disappointment's going to come, and I'm going to find myself discouraged. Desperation will raise its head, and I might find myself feeling defeated. In these day-to-day moments, we need to tap into this stowed-away faith. So how do we make room? Let's look at three ways this morning. First of all, we are going to recount his faithfulness in your life. There's a section of scripture in 1 Samuel. I said that. I did that in the first service. That's what Noah was saying when he corrected me. Not Samuel. Samuel. He typed it all out. It says it's not Samuel. It's Samuel. I had no clue what he was talking about until just now when I did that. 1 Samuel chapter 30. David and his followers, they return home, and the campment that they have been in has been raided by Amalekites. And all the women and all the children, they've been kidnapped and taken with them. And David's men, that those people that have stuck with him, they're ticked off, and they're looking at stoning their leader. And it says, and I believe it's in verse 6 of that, yes, verse 6 of 1 Samuel 30, David strengthened himself in the Lord. That word strengthened, it literally means he seized, he grasped, he kept hold of the strength he had in the Lord. I wonder what he was seizing a hold of specifically. There are so many different moments that he could be looking at. Maybe beyond the moment that he's looking at right now, he might be looking at just the past couple of weeks. He's actually in Philistine territory right now. He's on the run from Saul. He sought refuge among his enemies. And his enemies, seeing the incredible opportunity of having somebody with the strategic knowledge that David has, they say, sure, come on in. And so David, he's living among his enemies as a refugee at this moment in time. And so maybe he's looking back and he's saying, yeah, it seems rough right now, but it could be so much worse. I could have the Philistines chasing me too. Maybe it's not just that. Maybe he's going back a few years and he's thinking back at his time with Goliath. What that looked like as a 17-year-old boy standing before a nine-foot giant. I don't know what a person that weighs nine feet weighs, but I got to guess it's probably over 400 pounds. And I know as a 17-year-old kid, I'm not going to want to take over and take on anybody over 400 pounds. I'm not going to want to take over somebody 150 pounds. You crazy? I'm not doing that. But David, he comes and he stands before this guy in the armor. He stands before this guy with the shield. He stands before this guy with the spear. And all David has is the the, the clothes he's wearing and the five smooth stones that he takes from the river. And he doesn't need five. He just uses one. And so right now, when it's a few years later in his life and his men want to stone him, he might be thinking about back to some other stones in his life and just one stone that God used to deliver him in a single moment. And he recounted God's faithfulness in his life. Maybe he looked back even a little further to when he was growing up and he was in the field. And he looked about how when the lion attacked or the bear attacked, or there was all these animals that were threatening the flock. But God enabled him and God protected him. God used him to protect the flock. And he looked back and he recounted God's faithfulness in his life. Recounting what God has done always wells up faith within you. You want a guarantee of welling some faith up within you? Look back at what God has done in your life. He hasn't left you. He hasn't failed you. The author of Hebrews, he wants to let his readers know that. And so in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, he says, I will never leave you. I will never fail you. I will never abandon you. 
couple verses later in verse 8, it says he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So if the same God who didn't abandon me yesterday, if he is the same character traits, the same characteristics, the same heart yesterday, and he has it today, he better be sure he's going to have it tomorrow. You can rest assured in that. Recount his faithfulness in your life. That's what Isaiah is recognizing when he writes in Isaiah 43. It's not on the screens today, but I want to read it to you if my thing will open up. He says, do not be afraid, for I have ransomed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. Look at the reflection of what God has already done. Don't be afraid. Look what I've done in the past. I have ransomed you. I've placed my mark upon you. Your ownership is sealed within me. Verse 2, when you go through the deep waters, I will be with you. When you go through the rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned up. The flames will not consume you. When you recount what he's done in the past, you're going to be able to look forward to what he is going to do for you in the future. And it's not free. It costs you. It takes work to recount because you don't want to recount. At least not at first. It's easier to complain. Sometimes it's more fun to complain. Who doesn't like to complain from time to time? I know I like to complain every now and then. It makes me feel better to complain, but it makes me feel even greater to recount. Stop complaining. Take the work. Take the intentionality and recount what he does. It will stow faith within you. Secondly, this morning, rename faithless thoughts. Faithless thoughts, they're inevitable. It's inevitable. It's only natural to look at something catastrophic in your life and to have the faithless thought behind it. But we walk with Jesus, or rather Jesus walks with us. And so even though faithless thoughts are natural because we walk with Jesus, we're not meant to walk in the natural. We're meant to walk in the supernatural. And when you walk in the supernatural trust and the supernatural faith that he gives, you're able to rename faithless thoughts. The way you do that is first got to identify it real quick. And it's easy to identify the faithless thought. It's the one that probably will creep up its head right away. And the moment you do, feelings of despair will settle in hopelessness begins to come over your spirit and your disposition. Your total countenance begins to change. You can easily identify faithless thoughts, but then to eradicate it, that takes some work. Identify it first, eradicate it once you know it's there. Chapter 10, verse 5 of 2 Corinthians, we destroy every proud obstacle that keeps people from knowing God. We capture their rebellious thoughts and teach them to obey Christ. Take captive every thought. And when it's there and you know it's there and it's in your grasp, shift the thinking. Paul, he tells us and he exhorts his readers in uh, Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right, and pure, and lovely, and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. That word fix, it means to calculate. It means to consider. It means to think about, and it means to believe. And in order for you to calculate what it is that God wants you to calculate, that's going to take some time. In order for it to consider in your life, it's going to take some effort. When you think about it, that's an active choice. When you believe, it's a work of faith. Fix your thoughts on what benefits your life. Thoughts, they're random. 
Random thoughts pop in all the time. You could ask Noah about random thoughts. Yesterday morning, I went into his room, and Noah, he usually talks to us on his phone. That's just the easiest way for him to do so. And I picked up his phone because I thought there was something he was wanting to say to read it. And wouldn't you know he had a Google search going? That boy Googled, are Dalmatians good with kids? Talk about random. We're not getting another dog. I'm going to stretch out the life of this one that I have currently as long as possible. We're not getting two dogs. We haven't talked about two dogs. He knows we're not getting two dogs. I don't know what's going on. The only thing I could think of is that there is this movie coming out in about a month. It's the backstory of the villain from the 101 Dalmatians. The only thing I was thinking of, because Noah, he is a little movie buff, is that he was thinking about it and just it popped in his mind. But he's like, no, that's not it. It's just this random thought. Random thoughts will always pop into your mind. When it pops in, you need to rename that random thought that is bringing you down. Rename faithless thoughts by reminding yourself. When you're forgotten, remind yourself that you are actually chosen in him. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, but you are not like that. You are a chosen people. You are a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God. Maybe sometimes a random thought's going to pop in and you're going to feel unwanted but you're going to have to remind yourself that you're not unwanted. You're actually desired. John chapter 14, verse one, do not let your heart be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. In my father's house, there are many rooms. If it were not so, I wouldn't have told you. So I go there to prepare a place for you. He desires you. You're not forgotten. You are desired. Maybe sometimes you feel worthless. But instead of feeling worthless, if you can rename that worthless thought to actually that you are valued, the truth of your value is revealed in Ephesians chapter 2. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ. Maybe you feel like you're a lost cause, that there is no hope for you whatsoever, but you are not a lost cause. You can rename that lost cause thought in your mind that you actually have a purpose. The other part of Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, so we can do the good things he planned for us to do long ago. Maybe you have some fear in your life and you're uncertain about what you should do or how you should do it, but you can replace fearful thoughts with faithful thoughts because in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, God has not given us a spirit of fear. He's given us a spirit of power. He's given us the spirit of love, and he has given you a sound mind. How do I stow my faith? You need to rename faithless thoughts that arise. Thirdly today, recover actions that build up your faith. This is the hardest of the three. Because we're most susceptible to faithlessness when acts that require faith aren't sowed upon in our lives. Faith is weak when it's not fed. God gives faith. It's my job to maintain faith. Maintaining faith takes some work. Faith being maintained in my life is going to be a challenge. Paul, he praises the Macedonian church in 2nd Corinthians chapter 8. Because the Macedonian church has every reason to hold in, to gather in, to keep to themselves. They have every reason to do so, but they refuse to do so because they understand the point that there are actions that sow into your faith that don't just benefit those of the recipients of those actions, but they benefit you as well. I want to read you four verses from chapter 8. Paul, he says, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace God has given the Macedonian churches. In the midst of severe trial, their overflowing joy and extreme poverty welled up in rich 
generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able, and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. What actions is God asking you to do that's going to build your faith? It might cost you some time. To, you need to pray. That prompting that comes. You don't know why you're going to pray, but like what Brother David was sharing, you just know you have to pray. And as you're praying, God is doing a work, and He's doing a work not just within you, building your faith, but He's doing a work maybe on the other side of the world. But it's going to cost you some time. It might cost you some of your conveniences and your priorities. Maybe you just need to get into the Word a little bit longer, a little bit harder, a little bit stronger than what you've been before. But getting into the Word means that you're going to be changed by the Word. And so you might have to lay down some of your preconceived thoughts and you might have to stop living in such a way that you always thought acceptable because the Word is starting to speak to you, but you're recovering an action that is building your faith. Maybe you need to connect through worship and you just don't even, you can't even imagine going through this time right now and being able to lift your hands in worship. But your faith is starving and it might just take taking a moment and recovering just an act of worship of simple of just lifting your hands and singing and see that God will begin to heal and restore faith and faith will stow within you. How do I stow my faith today? Recount his faithfulness in your life. Rename faithless thoughts that arise. Recover actions that build your faith. This morning, what is this all about? What is this all about here this morning? Enduring faith is developed. It just doesn't appear. Faith that God gives for to endure, you're going to have to develop it. If there's one thing that a supersized faith is certain to do, when you make that prayer like the disciples made and say, increase our faith, I can guarantee that it's going to bring an opportunity for testing as well. There's going to be the testing that comes with it. Maybe you could think back to a time when you first got saved And there was expectation and there was joy and there was excitement. But I guarantee you when that first happened and that first declaration and faith was first deposited in your life, maybe it was an hour, maybe it was a day, maybe it was a week, but there was a testing. Someone came up to you and told you something that rubbed you the wrong way. Maybe the car wouldn't start the next morning. Maybe you got fired from a job. I don't know what it was, but there was definitely a testing. When faith is deposited, you can believe that there's going to be a testing along with it. But you are meant to overcome the trial and tribulation. And it's best to overcome through great faith. Great faith comes from intentionally developing what God has given you. It's just not going to appear. Do you have room in your life for what God wants you to have? He's willing to make the deposit. Are you willing to make the room so it could be stowed in there? If you are, you would be able to say this verse with confidence the final verse of our main text that we read this morning. That we won't belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed, but those who have faith and are saved. Every head bowed, every eye closed this morning. Perhaps you're in this place right now, and by place right now, I'm not talking about here in this sanctuary, but you're in a place where you need a strengthened faith. 
You need a stowed faith. And there are some things in that you want to change in your life. But you know that it's going to be a cost. That you want the great faith. You want the supersized faith. But to transition from the comfort that I'm in now to the way that God is challenging me to live through his word. I want to do it. But I need help doing it. To stow the faith. It's going to cost me greatly. But if God is faithful, God will be faithful. And I promise you, he will. But this morning, if you are willing to lock arms with him and you are willing to recall his faithfulness and you're willing to rename those thoughts that you've gotten comfortable with and you're willing to recover the habits that build faith, he will do it. He will do it today. This morning, if that's you and you need a stowed faith, a faith that sustains, lift your hand. There's hands in this place today. This morning, we want to open up an altar for you to be able to pray. I challenge you to make an altar. There is a principle of being altered at the altar. God makes changes within us when we make the step forward, when we make the step outward. And maybe it's not necessarily stepping forward right here to this physical area, but maybe it's going to be stepping up and just standing up. Maybe it's been six months or six years since you've lifted your hands in worship and God is challenging you and saying, recover the act of worship and see the faith that builds up within your life today. Maybe he's saying, just bend there and get on your knees at your seat and see what happens when you submit your physical posture to what it is that he wants to do. Don't let this moment go without him stowing faith within you. Let's pray. With every battle with every heartbreak with every circumstance I believe that you are my fortress you are my portion you are my hiding place I believe you are the way the truth the life I believe you are The truth, the life, I believe you are. Through every blessing, through every promise, through every breath I take, I believe that you are provided. Protected, you are the one I love. I believe you are the way, the truth, the life. I believe you are the way, the truth. I'm set on you 
and you meet me here today mercies that are new all my fears and doubts they can all come to because they can't stay long when i'm here with you it's a new horizon and i'm set on you and you meet me here today with mercies that are new all my fears and doubts they can all come to because they can't stay long when i believe you are the way the truth and doubts they can all come to because they can't stay long when I believe you are the way the truth the in faith this week that you believe he is the way that he has the answer you need he is the truth you need he is the life for you it is there believe it believe it wholeheartedly this week especially as we're living it out this week we were going to do our normal we're going to think on this and we're going to ask ourselves the question how well does my faith hold up under pressure and what has caused this result you might go to a great end of the spectrum on this maybe your faith holds up well because you have put into practice things that build your faith and help it to endure reflect on what actions that has had that effect in your life. But maybe your faith doesn't hold up well under pressure. And the times get rough and it quivers and it quakes and it fails. When that happens this week or when it's happened, identify then the faithless, faithless thought that comes on along with that. And then locate a verse in Scripture which proves that thought wrong. Memorize that verse. There is power in memorizing Scripture. Memorize the Word. Amen? Amen. I'm going to close out this moment of service here. I'm going to say a closing prayer, and then we're going to cut our live feed, and I want to talk to you guys for just a couple of minutes here uh, after that. But do not forget, as you leave today, be generous. Be generous. Let's give, and let's help make a difference in the Philippines. Let's help make a difference and reach those incredible people so that they can know Jesus. Amen.
Also, don't forget that next week, single service, 10 a.m. It's going to be awesome. We're going to have a lot of fun, and it is going to be a great, great experience. Do not forget about that. We will be reminding you throughout the week, I promise you. So uh, we won't let you forget, but let's go close in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word today. Your word brings power and life into our lives. God, we thank you for it. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to hold on to your word this week. Lord, let it remain constant in our life. Lord, bring back to memory this word today so that when the obstacle comes, the challenge comes, whatever it is that's going to come our way this week, Lord, that we would remember it and that, Lord, we would be able to live it out. Lord, give us the grace to do that. Father, we pray, Lord, for your blessings upon our offerings today. Lord, we pray that you would bless each and every giver today. Meet every need that's represented, Lord. Every seed that is sown in faith today, Lord, we pray that it would reap a hundred times more that it's planted, Lord, that you would bless your people today. Father, bless our missionaries. Lord, allow them to raise those reindeer, remainder of those funds quickly that they can get to the work that you have called them to, Lord. Meet every need they have in the name of Jesus, we pray. And we glorify you. Amen, amen, amen.